Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to this session of the 2021 AFA Aerospace Warfare Symposium. I'm really pleased to host a top-notch panel today with General John Hyten, General Tim Ray, and Lieutenant General Tom Boussier to discuss the importance of maintaining the nuclear triad in planned nuclear modernization efforts. And to cut to the chase, for more than half a century, the nuclear triad of ICBMs, nuclear-equipped aircraft, and sea-launched ballistic missiles has served as the bedrock for the United States national security by providing a successful deterrent to nuclear armed adversaries. Yet, over the last 30 years, the Department of Defense nuclear modernization programs have been repeatedly truncated, deferred, or outright canceled in favor of other programs that were deemed higher priority at the time. The culmination of these decisions that use nuclear modernization as a bill payer is a triad that is on the brink, with nearly all its major systems operating well beyond their original planned service lifetimes. Yet at the same time, Russia is pursuing multiple nuclear weapon modernization programs, China is developing its own nuclear triad, North Korea and Iran continue to develop their own destabilizing nuclear programs. The U.S. simply cannot tolerate any further delays in modernizing our nuclear forces in the face of these significant threats. While there are important future policy decisions that will be taken up under the new administration's nuclear posture and missile defense reviews, there are a number of critical programmatic decisions looming closer on the horizons. This include, or they include, funding for the ground-based strategic deterrent, nuclear certification of the F-35, and milestone B approval for the long-range standoff weapon. That's why we're really fortunate today to have a fantastic lineup. They're the key leaders overseeing the nation's nuclear forces and are therefore uniquely positioned to provide insight about the implications of these decisions. First, we have General John Hyten, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In this capacity, he's the nation's second highest ranking military officer. And before taking on this position, he served as the commander of US Strategic Command. Next, we have General Tim Ray, Commander, Air Force Global Strike Command and US Air Force's Strategic Command. General Ray commands more than 33,000 professionals operating at two numbered air forces and oversees the nation's ICBM and bomber forces as well as their associated nuclear command and control facilities. And Lieutenant General Tom Boussier, Deputy Commander, United States Strategic Command, which is responsible for strategic deterrence, nuclear operations, global strike, missile defense, joint electromagnetic spectrum operations, targeting, and missile threat assessment. Tom, I don't know how you get any sleep at night. But gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. I'd like to start by giving General Hyten the floor to kick us off with some opening thoughts followed by our other speakers. So General Hyten, over to you. Thanks General Deptula and, and thanks to AFA. It's, you know, I, it's always good to be back in uh, the Air Force family. I've been in the joint world uh, uh, a long time now. So it's good to get back with my brothers and sisters in, in Air Force Blue. I wish we were together. I uh, wish we were uh, down in Orlando uh, this is my last year in uniform. That's the, the part I know. I'll retire in November. So I was hoping this year to spend a lot of time, uh, you know, at uh, AFA Symposium at Corona's, and I'm just not sure that that's going to happen. But this is a great way to, to set it up, a great way to uh, to work through it. And, and I'm, I'm glad to be with T. Ray and Tom as we start talking about nuclear modernization inside a new administration. So with the topic of nuclear modernization, uh, it can be a very complicated discussion. Uh, it can be a difficult discussion. It can uh, be an expensive discussion. There's a lot of ways to characterize it. But to me, this is one of the most simple discussions that we have in our nation's uh, uh, defense, our nation's current defense, our nation's future defense, because it's all about the threat. And, and if you talk about our nuclear modernization approach and our nuclear approach, you have to start from the threat. And the threat is significant and the threat is modernizing, and the threat has been modernizing for decades, and we have not effectively uh, responded. So 
let's just talk about uh, the great power competition that we're in in the world today. That's what the current national defense strategy calls it. Uh, that's a good description. It, uh, when you look at the nuclear threats that we face, it's China and Russia and, nuclear, and North Korea and Iran, but primarily the great powers of China and Russia. Let's, let's start with Russia. So with Russia, uh, we just uh, extended the New START Treaty, uh, which I think is a good thing. I think Admiral Richard at Stratcom thinks it's a good thing. I know the chairman thinks it's a good thing uh, because it puts limits and a verification regime in place for the large number of Russian nuclear capabilities, the bombers, the uh, ICBMs, uh, and the sea launch ballistic missiles, the SLBMs. Uh, so we get good insight into that. We put limitations on that. Uh, that's, that's a good structure, which is why I support New START. But as uh, the Secretary General of NATO, Jan Stoltenberger said recently, uh, that has got to be just the beginning of a discussion with the great powers of the world. This is not an end state. The fact that we extended a new start for five years doesn't tell what the world's going to be like beyond 2026 uh, when new start will expire. Uh, and we better start talking about what that world looks like as we walk into it. Because if you look at Russia, it's not just those three elements I just talked about, but it's all the new capabilities that they're building as well. And uh, Vladimir Putin has been talking about these a long time. He started talking about it when he was elected uh, president 20 years ago. Uh, he announced the modernization program in 2006. In many cases, their modernization program has completed and they have research and development going on into new uh, dangerous uh, nuclear weapons, uh, a nuclear powered, a nuclear armed a torpedo, a nuclear powered nuclear armed cruise missile, uh, the new class of submarine, the Sever Defense class submarine uh, that can uh, carry sea launch cruise missiles in large numbers. Uh, all of those are not accountable under the New START Treaty. All of those can threaten the United States um, and they have to be dealt with as we go into the future. Now, hopefully we can work uh, some understanding in arms control, but we still have to deter those capabilities and the deterrence comes from our nuclear capabilities, which I'll talk about at the end. You go to China. China is the, the fastest growing nuclear power in the world and it's not even close. They're building uh, at a percentage level, more uh, new nuclear weapons than anybody on, on the planet. Uh, they're building new platforms. They're building new submarines, uh, new uh, airplanes, new missiles of a variety of types, new hypersonic capabilities, hypersonic capabilities that, uh, that we have no defenses for, the hypersonics that can be nuclear tipped uh, as they uh, continue to modernize. And we have no arms control agreement with China in any way. So we have no insight into their nuclear doctrine. Uh, with Russia, um, given our a long history of Russia all the way back to the Soviet Union, we have an understanding about our nuclear doctrine that when we sit down across the table from the Russians, we understand the role of nuclear weapons in our defense, their understanding of nuclear weapons in their defense. But with China, we have no understanding of that. That is a difficult place to be. So you put that lack of understanding with a very rapid modernization program across the board that has been underway for decades as well. And then you compare it to our nuclear modernization program. Our nuclear modernization program, as you just described very well, uh, is, is late to need. As Russia is finishing, as China's in the midst of a, a rapid modernization, we're just starting our modernization. And it starts with the triad. The triad is basically the minimum essential capability for deterrence in the great power world we live in today. Uh, the bombers, the ICBMs and the submarines provide our structured deterrent baseline for dealing and deterring with this great power threat. Without one of those elements of the triad, it becomes very, very difficult for STRATCOM and for the nation to deter our adversaries. In the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review, we also looked at the overall structure and confirmed that we need a triad as we go into the future, but we also need a couple of other capabilities to deter Russia in particular and the capabilities we described were the sea launch uh, cruise missile uh, in order to respond to the Russian capabilities there and a low yield nuclear weapon that will deploy in small numbers on our uh, submarines in order to deal the th with the thousands of low yield nuclear weapons and tactical nuclear weapons that Russia is building and deploying that again are not accountable under the New START Treaty. So when you look at the structure that we have, it's actually a very a reasonable, uh, structured approach to dealing with the threats that we face in the world today. But because we're starting late, we're in a 
We're in a challenging time. They have to be delivered. They have to be delivered on time. Uh, we can't have any uh, interruptions in the program. That, that is a, a difficult place for the United States to be. Uh, but I think Secretary Mattis said it real well a few, few years ago when he looked at the budget and he looked at the nuclear element and he is not a, a nuclear uh, doctrine advocate by any means. And he said, American afford, can afford survival. And we can, we can afford that, that investment. And so we have to continue the investment in our triad and make sure that we look at all of our adversaries' capabilities and make sure we can continue to deter them. Uh, because the one thing we don't want is nuclear confrontation and nuclear war on this planet. And the only way to avoid that is to deter our adversaries. So I'll stop there, Dave, and thanks for the time. I appreciate it. No, I really appreciate that uh, summary, General Hyten. And uh, now let's uh, turn it over to uh, General Ray. Good morning, Dave, and, and I'll just echo General Hyten's uh, thanks for having the venue and for all that AFA does and how good it is to be with the teammates. Uh, you know, let me just follow your lead and get straight to the point, and, and hopefully I can uh, put some complimentary thoughts out there to where General Hyten just laid things out. Uh, when I think of the triad, I think of three key things, and, you know, it goes beyond the flexibility, the responsiveness, and the survivability, those attributes, those are well-worn paths. But today, 2021, I think of triad as triad plus. Um, you know, you talk about the three legs, but it it's just not gonna be real without the command and control. You know, and the command and control is that foundational piece. And, and I will say now more than ever, that's not a given, uh, that's a more contested reality based on who we're dealing with now in, in this particular conversation. Uh, General Hyde talked about the threats, and, and I mean, I can't add anything more to that, but uh, other than to say, I think our command and control is going to be contested. And so it's got to be much more relevant and resilient to be able to execute or terminate and do the things that we need to do for our, our national leadership. Second is, you know, we've never, never fought a nuclear armed adversary. And that, you know, while you may say we need to deter uh, China and Russia, the point being is we're now in this competition and certainly when you look at the regions where these two players want their sphere of influence and we talk about our values um, our values when you try to apply them to Beijing or to Moscow spell regime change right so they're not going to just uh, acquiesce to the world order and, and certainly our partners and allies who are out there uh, inside of where the these would be adversaries would want their sphere of influence or right on the edge you know, we need to, to clearly understand that we're in a competitive space and, and the nuclear dimension is on the table, not because we put it there, but because our would-be adversaries have placed that on the table. The third point I think about is, you know, when we start talking about the, the triad and, uh, you know, uh, certainly the question now becomes one of what is enough to deter, um, I just come back with it depends. Yeah, uh, to tug on where um, General Hyden took this, you know, all of those, all those sec deaths that have gone, you know, before the current team, uh, with the exception of one, one name, and that's the one that, you know, those who want to see no nuclear weapons, they go through that pile of very accomplished, um, you know, a national leadership to go find the one that echoes their views, but everyone since then has, has agreed of uh, the need for the triad, and, and I think the, the part that I admire about uh, where, uh, uh, Secretary Mattis was in terms of how uh, General Hyten explained. It. He said, and I think he's probably the brightest military mind of our generation. I think many would, would probably agree. But he says, I can't, I can't solve the deterrent equation in reducing from the triad. And and I think he did come in believing he could reduce it. But but if I had to answer the question of how much is enough, I think it's a series of framing policy questions that need to be intellectually uh, and, and you know honest honestly and intellectually answered and I think the first one becomes one of if we have the technical means to hold a, a military threat uh, at risk that would be holding us at risk should we make that our priority or would we go down the path of you know industrial centers command and control or large population centers I think we have a moral obligation anchor on addressing those threats. And I think that takes you down a certain path. But the cascading questions that come behind that, I think are important. Uh, I think about, you know, what does it mean for no first use as it applies to our partners and allies? 
and what it applies to us in the United States, and, and certainly our, our partners and allies out there in that sphere of influence that's being contested, you know, they have to ask themselves every day is, will we be there for them? Will be that guarantor of their security? And I got to believe that, that there has to be a very clear picture in our minds of what we'll do and what does no first use mean to them? Because if we can't come up with that really crisp answer, they now have to entertain their own nuclear program because they're dealing with conventional overmatch in their particular theaters. So we have that obligation. Then no first use for us in America, as we think about that, certainly there's the question of, would you just take the lay down and, and then deal with it aftermath? Do you have a, a question of uh, you know, no first use, of launch on warning, launch under attack? And, and how you answer those questions has a big part of the portfolio that you have there. And if you're just thinking no launch on warning and no launch under attack, you're going to take a very sizable lay down and you're going to have to have a very sizable arsenal to answer back. Or you've invested richly in ballistic missile defense, hypersonic defense, cruise missile defense. And if you think this portfolio is expensive, you know, then put a price tag on those capabilities to give us that guarantee. I, I, I don't think we have that answer. And then much to, to General Hyten's point, I think, you know, we, we have, I, thought, I think, done a good job of putting boundaries on the key piece of this conversation for nuclear weapons. But will you now try to create other strategic deterrent capabilities that fall outside of New START Treaty? Or will you let that be the only case? You can have policy conversations and treaty conversations, but will you put other strategic deterrent capabilities on the table that fall outside of New START Treaty? And can you do it in a way that makes it discernible and stand apart that you can actually say that's a strategic deterrent and not something else where I can be more ambiguous in terms of what it means and I leave my would-be adversary guessing. And that's really a dangerous game. So when I think about all those pieces and parts, you know, I'm prepared to come back and give my best military advice if asked and, and how I would begin to shape those. And then much to General Hyten's point, this is a numbers issue with our adversaries and, and how we deal with that. But what I would kind of cap all of that off with is to say that every single thing we're bringing to the table today with the GBSD, with the new bomber, with the new cruise missile, the new helicopter, all of those things are built with a value proposition of being in the game for a very long time. Nothing in the field today was built to be around that long. So when I look at the sustainability and the modernization opportunities, every single thing I bring in, the margin that I have, the modularity on the technical baseline, all those things mean that I can very rapidly bring on modernization. Here's an example. It would take me years to integrate a new standoff missile into the B-2. It will take me months with the B-21. I mean, to say it again, it would take me years with the B-2. It will take me months with the B-21 to, to add uh, more survivability to the LRSO will take me months, not years. And so I have enough margin and swap and all those things that give us that really solid foundational set of programs that are meant to be in the ground on the ramp or in the igloos so that we can do what we need to do based on capability and survivability. So I think that's an important part of how I think about the trial. Back to you, Dave. No, thanks very much for those insights. I thought uh, particularly insightful was that uh, no first use policy is going to dramatically increase uh, costs if uh, so. It's, it's not a uh, an easy solution. And then back to your starting point, it does depend. Uh, so let's uh, turn the mic over to General Boussier. Thank you, uh, General Deptool. As usual, it's a pleasure to see you and it's an honor to be part of this forum with General Hyten and General Ray. On behalf of uh, Admiral Rich, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about uh, STRATCOM's mission, how we view the threat and uh, strategic deterrence in the 21st century. And then uh, I'll cap out with the importance of the triad and nuclear modernization. So we, we view strategic deterrence and within that nuclear deterrence as the nation's and the Department of Defense's highest priority mission. In the basic practical terms, every O plan the Department of Defense operates is under the assumption that strategic deterrence will hold. In today's great power competition, the risk that it will fail is no longer zero or always low. If we fail, 
Nothing else in the department's going to work as designed. And this has profound implications on how we're gonna operate. Now, as highlighted by General Height, and this is the first time in history we have to uh, deter two near-peer nuclear armed adversaries who potentially could be cooperating with each other. They're increasing their reliance on nuclear weapons and rapidly expanding those capabilities and capacities, giving them a variety of options for nuclear use and unfortunately, including limited nuclear use. This calls into question whether or not they accept our view of how deterrence of nuclear weapons works. And I would offer to you, the use of nuclear weapons is not necessarily unthinkable in their minds. In reality, it may be difficult to deter nuclear use, particularly in a crisis that has not gone favorable for them. I'd offer to you that this requires us to rethink our approach strategic deterrence. First, we need to recognize that the actions throughout the continuum of conflict from competition to crisis, to armed conflict, to limited nuclear use, to full nuclear exchange are coupled and potentially non-linear. We have to consider our adversaries' decision calculus and behaviors, identify early threat indica indicators and conditions that could induce potential action in the gray zone. We need to understand where multiple actions combine to create conditions or perceptions of unavoidable conditions that could induce conventional conflict. We need to understand our adversaries' objectives that would drive them to nuclear use as the least bad option. Our deterrence approach must be based on a global mindset with integrated and a whole of, gov whole of government effort. Now, STRATCOM's ability to deter our adversaries comes from the combined attributes provided by each leg of the triad that together allows us to execute our national strategy. The triad provides the diversity and flexibility needed to deter each one of these adversaries. As Admiral Richard has stated in uh, the past, that if he were to lose any piece of the triad, it would drive him to ask for a new strategy. And could, and could potentially embolden our adversaries to believe they could actually employ nuclear weapons against us. Now, this is a fact that I don't think the general public or even many members of the Department of Defense fully understand. This creates a situation where we are at risk of making decisions without fully understanding the implications. While the nation's nuclear triad is currently safe, secure, and effective, we're rapidly reaching a point where we cannot continue to life extend our Cold War era weapons and carry out our national strategy. As highlighted, the Minuteman has been on alert 40 years past its intended service life. Now, while we're postured to sustain it until GBSD delivery, we could find ourselves in a position where that's not the case. As adversary defenses advance, we could be faced with, uh, with a point of departure where our effectiveness beco could become irrelevant. Now, I'd offer to you, it's not a choice between replacing these weapon systems or keeping them it's really a choice between replacing them or losing them. Now we need to discuss any policy uh, discussions or decisions regarding nuclear weapons are informed by accurate understanding of our adversary threats, the implication of any strategy change and the consequences for the future. Now Admiral Richard and US DRACOM is confident that deterrence remains sound today. We do have concerns about its viability in the future but we believe conversations like this today are important and informative, and we appreciate the opportunity to have a few uh, opening comments, and we look forward to your questions. Well, thanks very much, uh, Joan Boussier. I tell you what, I, those were insightful comments by all of you. Let's uh, uh, take a couple minutes here to drill down into a bit of detail. So let me start with General Hyten. Um, I'd like to start with a relatively uh, broad question for you. Um, as they did during the Cold War, nuclear capabilities continue to serve as the bedrock of strategic deterrence. However, in many respects, nuclear deterrence in the 21st century is a bit different than it was in the previous century. Um, what are some of the key differences in what must the United States do to adapt to the changing circumstances? So thanks for the question, uh, General Deptula. So. Uh, General Boussier kind of started down that path uh, when he talked about uh, 21st century uh, strategic deterrence. So let me just kind of start where he was and drill down like you asked. So uh, the one thing that I think you can't emphasize enough is that deterrence in the 21st century is wholly different than it was in the 20th century. 
Uh, and and it, it's for a number of reasons. The primary reason probably is that strategic attack uh, can no longer just be defined as nuclear attack. Uh, strategic attack now can come from uh, space. It can come from cyber. It can come from a, a very precise conventional weapons deployed in a, uh, in a strategic manner that can cause strategic uh, problems for the United States and Im impact our entire nation. Uh, there was a, a couple of lines, uh, one in particular in the, in the recent national defense strategy that's important uh, because in the space area, it said that an attack against our space systems will be in, considered an attack against the United States and will be responded to at a time, place, and domain of our choosing. The clear implication of that statement is that uh, a strategic attack in space doesn't necessarily um, demand a, another response in space. It could come from another domain. And that means any strategic attack we can look at as a, uh, as a, a opportunity to respond through any number of domains that, that we want to as we look at across. So when you look across the board at strategic deterrence, you have to think about it in those broad terms. Um, that's the, the structure of strategic deterrence that we have not fully embraced in the United States yet. And the academic community that came up with the original concepts for what deterrence is really has not embraced this new uh, construct and fully thought it out. I think as we look through uh, the next uh, couple of years of a new administration, the new administration will look at it through a nuclear posture review and a missile defense review. I'd like to see all those things together in a strategic deterrence review because when you look at offense, defense, and all the capabilities together, it's really about strategic deterrence. It's not just about nuclear posture. It's not just about missile defense. It's not just about space, because we may have a space posture review as well. It's about all of those things together that provide our overall strategic capability and our ability to strategically deter our adversaries. That's the difference of strategic deterrence in the 21st century. And it's gonna be a difficult problem because we've not fully thought it through. But the one thing I know is that Without the, the backstop of the nuclear triad, it basically all is impossible because it starts falling apart right from the beginning. So I'll stop there and, and turn it over to future questions. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for that. Joe Moussier, uh, could you provide your assessment of the current uh, security environment as it relates to STRATCOM's mission? As we've discussed, um, and most people recognize both Russia and China are investing considerable resources to modernize and expand not just their nuclear forces, but as General Hyden alluded to, uh, improving their conventional forces to be able to achieve strategic effects. What aspects of their military modernization programs do you find most concerning? No, uh, thanks, General Deptula. I guess. Uh... Um, one thing I've said in the last year is we need to really play, pay close attention to what China and Russia are doing versus what they're saying in public. Uh, as it relates to, to China, you know, despite their, their public stated no first use policy, they continue to pursue a triad. Uh, they've stated uh, their desire to double their nuclear stockpile in the next decade. Uh, they're developing survivable nuclear we weapons delivery systems. And all that coupled with the lack of transparency regarding its modernization efforts and the lack of uh, strategic stability talks is, is not necessarily a, a very encouraging uh, uh, path. Um, while they desire to be considered a nuclear peer, they are resisting any effort to actually act like one. Uh, now, as lo uh, on, lo on the long li uh, lines of Russia, uh, they've made it very clear that their nuclear weapons remain a critical element of their national security strategy. Uh, now, roughly uh, as of today, they're approximately 80% complete with their nuclear force uh, recapitalization, including an array of novel weapon systems. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, um, as Ab or uh, General Hyten has highlighted, uh, they have a, a significant amount of non-treaty accountable weapons, nuclear weapons, uh, including a nuclear armed ICBM launched uh, hypersonic glide vehicle, and of course, a very concerning uh, uh, nuclear powered underwater vehicle. Um, with, with many more, uh, to name a few. Um, I think the bottom line is uh, both China and Russia are exploiting the seams below the arm, uh, level of armed conflict in an attempt to gain strategic advantage in the pursuit of their national security objectives. Um, we need to find more innovative ways to continue to deter them and set uh, conditions favorable for the US and our allies. Very good, thank you very much.
Uh, General Ray, when you were uh, here last uh, time at one of our Aerospace Nation events, you mentioned that the long range standoff weapon or LRSO is critical to maintain tailored deterrence to reach any target in the world. And that there's a point in time where legacy weapons will simply not be survivable against modern air defenses. What's your perspective on the implications of any potential delays or truncations on the LRSO program? And are there any benefits to accelerating the program? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Dave. I was, in fact, I was talking to several members of the SASC uh, last week and the week prior who, who reached out to me to ask some of those very similar questions because it's, it's foremost in their thinking right now. And you know, I think when you, when you take a look at the threat and when you really see the intel behind what's out there, you know, slowing down isn't on, on, on the table. Um, in fact, when I saw the intel at the level that both of my, my colleagues here are talking about, I actually lost sleep for a couple of nights because it was very disturbing. I think from a, first and foremost, the, the program actually can overcome many of these near-term programmatic decisions. They've, uh, they've not taken a big enough hit long enough for us not to be able to accelerate. So funding is restored. I can't accelerate the program a year like we had planned coming into this poem. And certainly the program is very viable during fantastic. When, uh, when we, we ended up with only one competitor, we actually could change the relationship and talk about requirements in a way that was much more effective uh, this side of a, of a milestone decision. So we're, we're very healthy and I think that we can do it. The, the part that I, I step back and I ponder here, you know, is, is, is how effective this would be. And, and the conclusion I draw is that you've got a, a gravity weapon that's coming online in the Dash 12, and, and that's the first out of the shoot. Now it's the LRSO, then it's the GVSD, and then it's the uh, submarine. And so what you want to do is get as much margin as you can as you change out the triad. And so if you've got the opportunity, if you're doing fantastic on program development, and all the all the things I'm doing, this may be problematic to others, but the ICBM, the, the nuclear piece of the new bomber, the gravity weapon, the helicopter, the cruise missile, all those things combined are cheaper than the other leg of the triad that's being monitored. All my stuff put together. So if you've got a capability that is that affordable, that can be accelerated and, and the program is healthy, why wouldn't you buy down some of the risk of transition? And I think that's an important part of how we come after this. I think, you know, I talked about the extended deterrence and I firmly believe that a submarine in the, in the Atlantic or in the Pacific doesn't have the same extended deterrence deliverable to our partners and allies, which is not visible, right? Having a bomber with a cruise missile capability that can be present is something I think that's really important here. So um, I believe it's, it's very executable to accelerate. I think it's very important for the sequencing, but also a very, very important part of our extended deterrence conversation. Well, thanks very much for that. Um, and uh, let's uh, turn now to a, a subject, uh, General Hyten, that unfortunately we've uh, spoken mil uh, many times about before. And it appears that the budget knives are once again out for the uh, GBSD program, uh, the replacement for the Minuteman the three ICBM force. Why is this program critical and what are the potential implications of any further delays or even a cancellation of GBSD in terms of both cost and our overall nuclear deterrent posture? So our, our ground-based strategic deterrent, currently the Minuteman. And oh, by the way, um, for T-Ray, we got to find a name for GBSD. GBSD just doesn't hack it. I don't care whether it's Minuteman 4 or Peacekeeper 2 or, or you know, Black Forest one, I don't care, but there's gotta be a name for it for gosh sakes. Uh, because GBSD just, it's very hard to explain to the American people. I can explain Minuteman in a heartbeat, but GBSD requires me to define the term before I actually get into it. So for gosh sakes, for the Air Force, let's get a name for the thing and, and start moving forward with that. It's uh, coming, sir, any, any week now. All right, all right, well, I'll hold you to that, T-Ray. I, I, 11, 21, 21 is a day of retire. There better be a name for it before I, I get there. Uh, so uh, when you look at GBSD, and I'll use that term, unfortunately, the, uh, 
you have to look at the, the ground-based element of the triad and understand GBSD because Minuteman is going away. Uh, Minuteman can't survive. It's already 40 years, 40 years long as design life. It's going away. And, and when you, what you get from the ground-based uh, leg of uh, the, the triad is the most responsive leg. That, that's a, a huge element. That's what we always talk about. That's what uh, Admiral Richard has testified on. I think uh, General Ray, General Boussier, we've all testified it's the most responsive leg. But the other thing to remember about the ground-based leg is it's also the most difficult leg to fully target. Because in order to target 400 hardened silos across five states in the middle of America, an adversary basically has to commit hundreds, if not thousands of nuclear weapons in order to try to take that leg out. And if you do that, uh, no strat command, command, uh, commander has any problem telling the president of the United States what you have to do. And, and that decision to launch thousands of weapons against the United States is almost an impossible decision to make. But if you remove the ground-based leg of the triad, you're down to a number of platforms that you could take out with 20 strategic weapons that could be nuclear and non-nuclear to get after the entire thing because of the way we have our alert foster in the bomber force, the way the submarines are deployed. So you're basically an intelligence failure or a technical failure away from losing the entire structure. And if you go to that kind of number, all of a sudden China becomes you know, a peer adversary and maybe even a superior adversary in the nuclear capability. And we don't understand the nuclear doctrine and that puts you in a difficult place. So without that ground-based leg, our overall deterrence, especially with China, is really challenged. But with Russia, China, the, the ability of them to target the ground-based missiles that we have across five states in the middle of America is almost impossible right now. Uh, so we, we need a full triad. The ground-based missiles are a significant part of that triad. And uh, you know I'm, I'm just an advisor uh, on the Joint Staff, as is the chairman. But my military advice is that we need a triad as the minimum essential capability to deter the great powers that we uh, face in the world and will face for the next uh, coming decades. So over to you, Dave. Yeah, really well said, uh, General. Uh, General Boussier, let's shift gears just a little bit uh, to a subject that's extraordinarily important and uh, was mentioned earlier. Uh, and that's while nuclear platforms and weapons uh, tend to get most of the attention they simply can't provide uh, convincing strategic deterrence unless the U.S. also possesses an effective, effective nuclear command and control communications infrastructure. So what can you tell us about efforts to modernize our NC3 architecture and why are these activities a critical modernization requisite? Uh, thanks, uh, General Dutu. I guess I, l let me tie that together with one of my previous uh, uh, comments. So if, if we can all agree that the triad and nuclear deterrence is the bedrock to our Department of Defense's ability to maneuver on the global uh, uh, scene, uh, it's the, uh, the bedrock of our nation's defense, then the credibility of that nuclear deterrence is in our ability to command and control it. Uh, so NC3 is the critical link between the assured communications between the president and the fielded forces. In fact, in 2018, it was General Hyten when he was the commander of U.S. Strategic Command that the Secretary of Defense consolidated and delegated NC3 enterprise lead responsibility for the first time to the commander of STRATCOM. So Admiral Richard is the commander of U.S. Strategic Command and the commander of the NC3 Enterprise Center, also known as the NEC. And uh, in the last two years since uh, General Hyten initiated that uh, action, we've made uh, considerable progress. We stood up the NC3 Center, the NEC, uh, to oversee and align all NC3 efforts. We've improved the operational reporting uh, structure within the Department of Defense. Uh, we directed uh, um, investment in NC3 programs in cyber defense, some new authorities delegated to the commander of STRATCOM and the NEC. Uh, created an engineering framework for design and test and uh, actively engaged with industry uh, to incorporate best practices and technology. Now the command is uh, taking a four prong approach to developing uh, what we're calling NC3 Next, uh, which is the next generation nuclear command and control uh, communication systems. Uh, focused on uh, programs of record, currently uh, programs of record to deliver and modernize and sustain those core uh, capabilities and capacities. Uh, assess demonstrations, experiments and tests of innovative new technologies. Uh, 
one of General Hyten's favorite uh, topic is uh, reviewing and revising restrictive policies and TTPs and instructions and, and postures that have encumbered the department uh, from really uh, progressing to the next level and expanding uh, the use of critical technology enablers such as uh, artificial intelligence, digital engineering and modeling and simulation. Now it's important to remember that NC, NC3 modernization, uh, it's not viewed as a, a thing. It's a delivery system and a platform that's coupled into a continuous process of improvement and incremental uh, network capability improvement uh, to a system of systems. Uh, there are hundreds of systems that contribute to the NC3 architecture uh, and General Reyes uh, has the authority and responsibility or roughly 75% of them. Uh, and it's a journey that's ongoing. Um, but it's remember to uh, General Reyes' point, uh, we talk about weapons, we talk about weapon systems, but the NC3 system of systems underpins that and the credibility for our nation. Oh, very good, thank you for that. Um, General Ray. Uh, turning to the airborne leg, until the first B-21s become operational, uh, the current airborne leg of the tri is dependent on fewer than 100 B-52H and B-2 aircraft, with only the 20 B-2s capable of penetrating modern air defenses. In your opinion, how important is it to keep this leg operationally viable? Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. Um, you know, when I think about what's going on with partners and allies, and I think about, you know, what we bring to the table, when you're, you're in these times, you've got to come back to foundational principles. Um, so I think out there, what we can do that no one else can do, right? There are, there are neat, you know, aircraft carriers and with our, you know, partners and allies, there's allied space, there's allied airlift, there's allied fighters, there's actually hundreds of allied fifth gen fighters. There are no allied bombers. And th this is it. This is the Alliance's bomber fleet. And there are no allied ICBMs. We have a few allies with SLBMs and some gravity weapons, but there are no allied ICBMs. And so when we think about the role we play, it's not just for us, right? So it, it's for partners and allies and for stability in the regions. And, and I think about that uh, quite frequently. When you buy a bomber force, uh, you buy it to meet your conventional requirements. Then you size inside of that the nuclear piece to meet your treaty obligations. And, and so all the research has said what the size it needs to be north of 220. And the NDA said to build to that line. But you now need to manage that critical set of capabilities inside of that that are nuclear capable. And, and that's what I think, one, that's what LRSO does for us. That's what uh, the B61-12 does for us. Uh, that's what uh, the B-21 does for us in the future. And so I think that roadmap is a very viable and capable one. Um, but then you just step back and ask yourself a little bit more about you know, what we can do with our bomber force. You've seen firsthand now what we've done with our bomber task forces. And I'm very pleased to say a few people realize this, but I have the highest bomber air crew readiness in the history of the command in early 2021, even in the middle of COVID because of the way we've operated. We've gotten away from the CBP construct and we've operated with these bomber task forces. And we've been able to engage all over the planet in some very effective ways. Uh, imagine those as well with uh, hypersonics. Um, you know, in the way I'm operating the bomber fleet, we've already finished our, our ACE, our Azov Combat Employment Annex for the bombers. And so every one of these bomber task forces now we send out these short deployments, we're gonna refine that concept. So. There's a conventional viability and a nuclear viability. All those things robustly on the table, I think, really give us some tools and some options to, to really work that spectrum. When you think about our Agile Combat Employment Annex, we actually talk about the competitive space, mm -hmm. not just in the, in the, the warfighting space and what we can do in, in the message that sends. So I think all of that put together gives us a very unique capability as the United States and the United States Air Force. A oh, very good. Uh, bit of a follow-up. Um, beyond the bomber force, uh, the U.S. currently plans to deploy nuclear-certified F-35 starting in 2024 in order to gradually replace the F-15E dual-capable force. Why is this an important capability for our nuclear deterrent posture? And, and what's the value added beyond what the bomber force provides in terms of nuclear deterrence? 
Well, Dave, I think they're very complimentary yeah, in, in a very positive way. So when, you know, on my time in Europe, uh, I lived the NATO experience and, and NATO's, NATO's already said that, hey, we're nuclear weapons, we're a nuclear alliance, right? And so they put, uh, they put stock in being nuclear capable and certainly as we do things in Europe, you know, our contribution there, particularly with the F-35, it begins with the NATO dimension. So the B-61 and the F-35 are, I think, first NATO contributions. And that, that lets us have that forward capability that is a stand-in opportunity for that particular alliance. But certainly it, it's complemented by the standoff and the standing capabilities that we would bring with our bomber force and then our ICBMs and our uh, SLBMs. So I think it's it's the right fit, particularly starting with the NATO dimension, to, to bring that online. Well, thank you. Uh, gentlemen, we've not spent much time addressing the sea launch ballistic missile uh, force today. Um, with that in mind, and as a wrap up, I wanted to give each of you the opportunity to provide your perspective of the importance of the nuclear triad and any other closing thoughts that you might have. So let's go with uh, General Hyten, General Ray, and then uh, General Boussier in that order. General Hyten. So thanks again, General Deptula. So you know, we've, we've talked about a lot of things today, but I, I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking back to my confirmation hearing in 2016 before I went to STRATCOM. And as I was preparing uh, for the hearing, uh, there were a couple of key elements that they said I, I really needed to focus on um, to actually get through the confirmation hearing. Um, one was the broad question of how much is enough? How much nuclear is enough? Uh, and so I, I thought about it a lot and my actual answer on that one hasn't actually changed uh, in, the, in the five years since then. Uh, because how much enough is not a US uh, only question. It's a question that is based on what the threat is. And yes, we could drop the number of nuclear weapons but only if the threat changes. If the threat doesn't change, if the threat in Russia doesn't change, if that structure doesn't change, uh, as a military officer, I have to have the ability to deter the threat that exists, not the threat we wish existed. It is a, a real threat and we have to be able to deter that. And so the size of the force, the, th the three legs of the triad are the minimum essential capability we have to have. And I haven't changed my mind on that because the threat hasn't changed, it's only gotten worse. And it's real. So you have to be able to do with that. You can't just wish it away. Uh, the second piece of the puzzle that I think back is that as I was preparing for that hearing, uh, the folks here that were prepping me said I needed to, to really look in, and study in detail four elements of our nuclear posture. I needed to look at Columbia uh, with the, the, the Trident missiles. I needed to look at B-21, LRSO, and GBSD. If I studied those programs upside down, backwards, sideways, and understood what they were, I would be able to get through my hearing. And, and they were correct. And I got through that. And then I showed up at STRATCOM. And as I think General Ray and General Boussier both said, the first thing I realized is that those four are not sufficient. You have to have a nuclear command and control element. And as I dug into that, I realized we had problems there too, that we needed to figure out how to modernize. But then there was a sixth element. And that's the element that we haven't talked about today. And that is the weapon that actually goes on top of the missile, the weapon that actually goes in the B-61. Uh, those weapons are produced not by the Department of Defense, by the Department of Energy, the, headed by the National uh, Nuclear Security Administration uh, and the national labs and the nuclear production facilities across America that produce those capabilities. And if you think about all the modernization that we're having on the platform side, it has to be married with modernization on the weapon side as well, uh, because this country stopped uh, producing plutonium pits a long time ago. I think it, it should be a concern to everybody uh, in America that, uh, that every adversary that we face is building more plutonium pits than we are. Uh, that includes North Korea. Uh, how in the heck did, did that happen? Uh, it happened because we stopped the modernization program in the Department of Energy the same time we stopped the modernization program in the Department of Defense. And now the Department of Energy has to manage our modernization in uh, the weapon side of the house at the same time we're managing the platform side of the house. And those pieces have to be married together in order to effectively have a strategic deterrent when we get in the 2030s. 
So the Department of Energy and NSA and, and the labs will be delivering new nuclear weapons at the same time we're living nuclear platforms. Uh, so it's important for us uh, as leaders in the Department of Defense to closely partners with the guys uh, in DOE to make sure that those weapons are married and deliver in time. So we have a nuclear weapon council here in the Pentagon. We've had a great partnership with uh, NNSA and the Department of Energy, uh, but that delivery of weapons is just as essential because no matter how great the new bomber is, no matter how great the new LRSO is, the GBSD, uh, Columbia, if they don't have effective weapons that are maintainable and then they don't provide a deterrence. Uh, not a deterrence against uh, nuclear weapons. So those are just two things that popped into my mind as I asked the question. I really enjoyed the, the discussion today. Thanks very much for putting it on and I'll turn it over to uh, General Ray. Yeah, uh, General Hyden, thank you for that. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll start my closing comments by saying, you know, I pulled SAC alert back in the battle days, and, and there's not a nostalgic, nostalgic cell in my body for those days. I mean, that's not some reality I pine for. In fact, I, I wish deeply that we could avoid that. Um, let me add to, to General Hyden's list, his six, let me add a seventh, and that's the people. You know, let me just take a minute to brag on the strikers uh, over this past year and a half, who've just been brilliant during COVID and they've done just fantastic work and the teammates that we have in AFMC and, and AMC. Uh, let me just tell you the programs that are on the table with the new ICBM, uh, the cruise missile and the bomber. Um, you know, when I talked to Secretary Lord uh, prior to the milestone decision for the new ICBM, she said, this is the best acquisition program in DOD. And we've had an amazing table set for us in terms of programs. They're so good that the CAPE, the, the costers, their models don't actually apply because of the way we're doing software, where we're doing digital engineering. And, and all of these things are a formula for affordability and viability that we've not seen in the Department of Defense. And so it's incumbent upon us to, to deliver on the process that keeps us tied into the threats in the intel community, the technologies that are there and that we're very methodical on it. And I believe we built that particular process. So that's what we owe the American people is not spending another nickel beyond what we have to do because we can't just spend our way out of this. We've got to have a great capability in the ground backed up by the right people and the right command and control that's going to be viable. And I think, I think you've got the best set of cards you could possibly ask for going into this particular environment. But I do believe we've got to have an intellectually honest conversation about those series of policy questions, those framing questions. And then we can come back and as, as military leaders give our best military advice on where the low to high end risk is. Uh, anything different is you're picking a number and then you're backing yourself into a policy and a strategy. And I just don't think that's the right way in this particular portfolio. This isn't the, you know, this isn't healthcare, this isn't uh, you know, the, the tanker fleet, this isn't, you know, uh, anything else. This is the cornerstone of the security structure of the free world. And it's got to be given that right kind of energy. And, and I believe strongly that we need all three legs of the triad. These are foundational to who we are. So thanks for your questions and the time and appreciate being included. So, uh, General Deptula, th thanks for inviting STRATCOM to this conversation in this forum. Uh, it was, uh, it's an important conversation. Uh, I'd ask that we continue to have it. Um, not that General Hyten needs my affirmation, but I couldn't agree more uh, with his closing comments uh, on the, the state of uh, the nation, the state of the world, and uh, his statement that we have to see the world for the way it is, not the way we wish it to be. Um, uh, I guess I'll close by saying, uh, you know, it's been alluded to, but, you know, being accused of the, being a master of the obvious, um, you know, it's, it's an absolute privilege to be part of U.S. TRACOM's mission, to be part of this uh, very important uh, um, command. Um, but it's underpinned in the nuclear deterrence and the, the new enterprises underpinned uh, by our professional airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, and guardians, you know, officer enlisted civilian that provide this capability and capacity to our nation and our allies every day, 24, 7, 365. 
So as we talk about weapon systems and weapons and NC3 architecture and the need to continue to modernization efforts, let's not lose sight of the professional development, mentoring and uh, leading of our nation's most precious resource. And the, that is the uh, those that have volunteered and, and signed on the dotted line, that un, unlimited check to defend our nation and our way of life. So thank you again for this uh, opportunity. And it's always a pleasure to see everyone on this forum. Well, gentlemen, we've come to the end of this virtual aerospace warfare symposium event. Uh, thanks again to General Hyten, General Ray, and General Boussier. I have to tell you, it's really been an honor to uh, uh, to know you all uh, and to see you here. And I wish you all the best. Uh, you've got a lot of work to be done still yet between now and whenever you you step on the other side of that uh, uniform. Uh, and so please keep up doing the magnificent work that you are. On behalf of the Air Force Association, we wish you the very best as you continue to deal with the challenges that affect the strength of the United States as the preeminent nuclear deterrent power of the free world. So to you and to our audience, from all of us at the Mitchell Institute, have a great aerospace power kind of day out here.